you uh, can grab your Bibles. We'll do our Wesley Young Covenant prayer. Y'all ready? Here we go. I am no longer my own but yours. Put me to what you will. Place me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be put to work for you or set aside for you. Praise for you or criticize for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and fully surrender all things to your glory and service. And now, O oh wonderful and holy God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, you are mine, and I am yours, so be it. And the covenant which we have made on earth, let it also be in heaven, and all the people say, Amen. <coughs> so, I wanted to uh, take us on a little journey this morning to get, start, uh, to get started, and I thought it would be interesting to go back in time. You know, this is Grandparents' Day. We got the old folks in here. Should I walk out as the young person? Yeah. <laughs> but I think this might be kind of fun for you all. So um, uh, let's, I want to start with the greatest generation. And what I want to do is I want to talk about the technology that came to be with each of these generations. And it was during those folks that was born 1901, 1927, that the television was invented. Does anyone here have a television? <laughs> Raise your hand if you have a TV. Okay. Okay, you put it down now. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Good. <laughs> All right. The next generation was a silent generation. This is when the credit card came into existence. Who has a credit card? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? Sometimes. Oh, getting a little feisty. Next, we had the baby generation. The baby generation is when the remote control for the television came out. Before the remote control came out, how do we change channels? Son, go turn to channel three. <laughs> I was the channel changer. I was also the antenna turner. More to the left. More to the left. Remember those days? Well, was the remote control a good thing or a bad thing? Good. Who's got a remote control? Okay. Generation X, if you're born between 1965 and 1980, this is when the personal computer came out. Who here has a personal computer? Is it a good thing? or a bad thing? Most of us like it. The millennials, 1981 and 1996, this is when the smartphone came out. How many have a smartphone? Even most of the flip phones now are still smartphones. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? Mostly good, unless it's an Amber Alert, two in the morning. Oh. All right, next one is Gen Z. So we're shifting a little bit. Now we're going to move away from technology that you could touch and the technology that affects our lives in different ways. So the millennials were the first generation during the time of social media. So this all the rise of like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. How many of you are on social media? Actually, more hands than I thought. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? Tough line, huh? All right, now we're going to get into that younger generation. Generation Alpha, as it's called. These are the people that were born since 2011 until yesterday. 2011 to yesterday. What invention is shaping their lives? Anybody know? Artificial intelligence. Is artificial intelligence a good thing or a bad thing? 
Who here has used artificial intelligence? Wrong. Have you ever used your GPS on your phone? Yeah. You can raise your hand. <laughs> H- have you ever used closed captioning on a TV set? You can raise your hand. Have you ever called a phone number and it says, I recognize your phone that you're calling from? We all are influenced by artificial intelligence. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? But it's scary, isn't it? So those examples I gave you, they're probably really good uses of AI for our day-to-day life. But AI is becoming more and more powerful every day, and it's being used in a lot of ways that a lot of us aren't even aware of yet. Um, If if you look at your bulletin, I don't have one up here, Um, look at the cover of your bulletin. See that picture? I created this picture using artificial intelligence. Those are not real people. That image is created by artificial intelligence, but I have to tell you, that wasn't the very first picture I created. What I did was I went into a program that artificial intelligence creates things, and I said, I told the AI, I want an image of a loving family enjoying a sunset picnic in a field of wildflowers. Grandpa reads to his five grandchildren while grandma crochets nearby, and a red bird is on a branch overhead. And this is the first image I got. And it's pretty close, except grandma's not crocheting, and that boy next to grandpa looks like a mutant. I don't know if you can see it, but his face is all distorted. I said, well, that's not a very good picture for the cover of a church bulletin. Let me try this again. So I asked it again, and this time, well, I got two grandpas. (laughs) And, And that bird looks like it's about to beat somebody with a stick. So I had to go back into my program. I had to type a few more words and make some changes. And, well, 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 grandma's back. But that red bird is making a nest in her hair. So finally, I, I, I made a couple more changes. I said, you know, let's make grandpa Hispanic. What you have to do is you have to say things that are different enough that it forces it to rethink what it's going to create. So I said, make grandma, grandpa Uh, Hispanic, and I didn't worry about grandma doing crochet, and I got the image. Now, I have to wonder, did grandma die, and that's the daughter? Or did grandpa remarry and rob the cradle? (laughs) But I went with this image. AI is not infallible. AI is brand new. AI is... uh, It's trying to discover how it can be a good tool for us all to use. So is AI a good thing or a bad thing? Depends on how you use it. So there's a lot of concerns about the effects of AI. So I think it is important to see its potential for good. For instance, I use an AI application on my phone that gives me daily prayers for every day. It understands the different scripture I've been going through, and it leads me to a specific prayer that another pastor has done, and I read it and I go, wow, that just happened to fit what I like. It also gives me the opportunity to find other uh, Bible resources, to to search scripture very quickly. And you know, when you can't quite remember how a certain verse goes, instead of using a Google search, I can talk to it and it says, well, this is where it is. And these are all the places in the Bible where that word is being used. And wow, it's a powerful tool. And it's the same power, that tool that could be used for within your own communities, with your own families. So you can have discussions about who God is who the son was, who were the the disciples. It's a great tool in the right context. My big question is, though, when we think about those kids who were born in the age of artificial intelligence, 
How is it going to influence their relationship with God? Will artificial intelligence replace God in their lives? And that's a very real possibility. Or can AI have them create a stronger, better relationship with God? That's a very real possibility. What happens to your grandchildren and great-grandchildren depends on you. It depends upon how you come alongside them. You have to imagine this world where <clears throat> your grandchildren, they're immersed in a world where AI is going to be their constant companion. You ever drive your car using the GPS like we talked about? AI was your constant companion on the road. But you made a constant uh, 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 a decision to use that GPS AI. Kids, growing up now, it's just present. They're immersed in artificial intelligence. They have no choice but to be in a world of artificial intelligence. So you're the bridge between tradition and innovation. You're the storytellers who can share the wisdom that transcends the time. If you can get that tablet away from them to have the conversation. I want to explore what scripture might be saying about this whole idea of artificial intelligence. It turns out the Apostle Paul, he kind of warned us of what the impact would be when we start to use other things to substitute for God. In his letter to the Romans, chapter 1, you get to verse 18, he jumps right into this topic. He says, for since the creation of the world's God, sorry, since the creation of the world's God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. And exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. What did I just show you on the cover of your bulletin? Image of people created with birds and flowers. I was like a little mini god. And I created <coughs> mankind and animals and nature. Right now it's two dimensional. I could have put that up on a TV set or on a video and animated it. They could have been talking, having a conversation, the bird could have been singing, and your kids wouldn't have known it wasn't real. That's what Paul's talking about. That when people start to get to where they know God's real, they hear about God, their parents and grandparents had told them about God, but say, I don't need the God, I've got this other imagery of God that I like better because I could do with this what I want to, not what you say I should do to honor that God. We are living in a much more sophisticated time than Paul was. He'd probably be appalled right now. It's a bad pun. He would, he would be upset with where things are going and with how we are so a easily able to world with our own gods. I'll tell you what's happening right now very quickly. 
create the possibility where you could have a conversation with a dead loved one. You, ha- you can actually, right now, go online and have a conversation with a dead cele- a live celebrity, for that matter, and a, or a past celebrity, or politician. Anyone they've got video and voice recordings for, they can reanimate, look real, and you can have a conversation. In China, the number one selling software industry right now is conversations with dead relatives. You send in all the stuff you have, they create an AI impression of that person. So you pick up the phone, you say, Hi, Anna. Hi, darling, how are you? I've been having a hard time at school, but you're, you're in third grade. It knows everything about you. You can have a conversation with someone who doesn't exist because you can create your own God. Imagine being age 14 or under, and you don't know that that's not real. For you, that is real. You grab that tablet and you saw mom talking to Nana. I want to talk to Hi, son. That's the world we Praised, amen. Change the truth. That's exactly what's happening. Intelligence is moving. Chat GPT. It actually. Um, what it does, all, in, okay, say, a broken toaster in Google. For how to fix a broken toaster, that, oh, that's a source I've used before. I'm going to click on this one. Then you get step-by-step directions for how to fix a toaster. says, here's what you do. First, unplug it from the wall. Good advice. Is the AI good or bad? <laughs> and thousands and thousands of documents that it's been able to accept. Chat GPT creates a new reference point for you. It becomes your mentor. ChatGPT went live November 63,000 first impressions. 200 million. This growing technology. Last month, two used ChatGPT. You know they existed. The question you have to ask, though, is what is that underlying source of data that is there goodness in it or maliciousness? Entities, organizations trying to make money. They're trying to. Is that a good thing or bad? They exchange the truth about God for a lie. Now, I called my sermon this morning the three R's. And I was thinking about how, what we used to, remember, who all knows what the old three R's are, right? Reading, writing, and arithmetic. It was funny, Stacy said, is that a spell check? 
I said, no, Stacy, I'm old. That's how we spelled it. <clears throat> Reading, writing, and arithmetic. So every generation is different in how we've learned. Now, reading, writing, and arithmetic has been how we learn for centuries. Not much changed, but it's changing now. We're already starting to see is this shift in how kids learn. And a lot of you grumbled about it as parents, this new math and all this kind of stuff, right? So as, as teachers, you're, you're working with it, doing the best you can to have the tools you have so the kids can learn most efficiently. But what we're really seeing is there's a new shift in how people or how kids are being taught. And the new three R's are relationships, resilience, and reflection. Now, just to be clear, this isn't a specific curriculum that kids are being taught. This is kind of a, kind of a structural narrative that they're being motivated by and moved to that... They have to be able to form good relationships. That sounds wonderful. They have to be resilient in life and learn resilience. That's good. And they have to be able to have uh, value reflections on life. I think those are wonderful things for kids to learn. But in the age of AI, it starts to have a little bit of a different meaning. So if it's okay with you, I want to walk you through these three things. And put on your grandparents' hats or your parent hats. And you say, what is it that's going on with my grandchildren, great-grandchildren, or even my children that I should be paying attention to? <clears throat> so when we think about relationships, kids make a lot of connections online. And... The good part is they're making, it's making them very adept at digital communications on the internet, and being able to communicate with one another. When I was up in Milwaukee uh, visiting the grandkids, I heard voices from the other room, and I was like, what is that? And I walked in there, and my grandson's playing a, a racing video game, and other kids were talking to him, and it, there was like eight or nine of them in different parts of the world all playing this game together. That's pretty cool. He was interacting with these kids that he's never, can't even see their pictures. But they were having relationships, and I heard them yelling at each other even. But the problem is, it's also allowing them to have less face-in-face -face interactions. You all know that's a problem. And so, kids are having to learn how to navigate these virtual and real-life relationships at the same time. What does that mean for God? Well, quite honestly, artificial intelligence can lead to a, a superficial understanding of spiritual practices. AI will answer the Bible questions, you know, um, who was Jesus? Who were the disciples? But the question is, who's providing that data? Who's teaching them those lessons? And you all know kids are curious. Those are the kinds of questions they may be asking. Especially after grandma leaves, grandma visits, takes them to Sunday school, they learn a Sunday school lesson, they get home, they're cu curious about it, and they chat GPT or wherever they go and say, why was Judas the bad guy? What answer are they getting? The second R is resilience. So kids... In this artificial intelligence world, they're growing up with this constant flow of information and online pressure. And for the most part, they can develop their resilience skills one of two ways. Who's here has heard of cyberbullying? 
Who's here hurting children that have committed suicide because they were bullied over a post? There's a fellow I was just reading about yesterday, a football player. He thought he was having an online relationship with an 18-year-old girl, fake images. He was tricked into sending photographs of themselves in a compromising position. Then he finds out it wasn't a real person and he was being blackmailed. And he had to come up with enough money that they were going to send the pictures to his family. And he tried and he couldn't get the money raised. And the guy said, well, we're, we're going to be sending the photos today. And he killed himself. He wasn't very resilient with the information. He didn't understand he was living in a make-believe world. I'd have to say AI probably helped lead to his death. Is AI a good thing or a bad thing? Now most kids, they can bounce back from things in life. Imagine your, uh, your kids are at a soccer match. They lose the game. By the time they get to the car, they're thinking about it. You say, okay, we're going to Dairy Queen. By the time they get home, they're over it. Then they get online, they start getting picked on and taunted for that terrible pass they made or missing that goal. They get overwhelmed by the distractions and the back lack of good validation. What about God and all this for resilience? The reality is that artificial intelligence only provides gratification. When I'm typing these things on my chat GPT, I'll actually do things like, here's the response What's the recommended blah, blah, blah? And it'll say, that's a great idea to explore those opportunities. It's creating a relationship with me. Sometimes I'll even type, sorry, I meant. Anyone here ever say, I'm sorry to Siri? I'm serious. Yeah. If you start using those tools, they start having an interactive personality, and I say sorry to my GPS. I'm sorry, the address was this. What's the opposite of that? I learned to become a calloused person, and so my first instinct is, oh, you did it wrong. You should have known I meant this. Is AI good or bad? If you're under 14, how do you know? And AI can weaken their ability to cope with real life challenges and diminish their connection to faith. We are all grounded in God for the most part. We know that we have problems or difficulties. We live in it, lean and live into that promise that God is with us, God will guide us, God will get through us. If I discern what God has for me to do, I can move in the right direction. Children don't have that, they have AI. You have time to play one more game? How about we play this game this time? You're probably better at this one. Let's look at that last R, reflection. The reality is Gen Alpha kids, they process information faster than you can imagine. Because from the time they were born, they've been brought into a world where technology exists. They don't know that the GPS giving you directions is, is a thing. That's what we use. They don't understand that the cartoons that they're watching on the tablet weren't even around 15 years ago. Artificial intelligence is their life. Let me ask you all a question. 
Who has a remote control for the TV? All right. What do you do when you lose the remote? I have one TV set only has an on-off button. If I lose the remote, I literally cannot do anything with it. I have to download an app and use the app on my Vizio TV. <coughs> Let me ask another question. How many of you ladies can take your remote away from your husband on the game day? <laughs> Imagine that remote control and how it's integrated itself into your life. That's AI for children. It's not something that you can take away. And without it, they're going to be lost. They won't know how to navigate through life because that is the life they're growing into. The reality is that the more dependent they become on this artificial life, the stimulation that they're given, the less they can cope with real life challenges and diminish their connection to faith. They instantly lose interest in the thought that God will provide. Why do I want to wait for God to provide when I can just reset and start this all over again and enjoy my life over here? When you're young and you're living, and even as you get older and you're living in an AI world, it begins to hinder your ability to process your experiences. It begins to, to erode your ability to grow strong in your faith. It's the world's best distraction from the one true God. Now, if I've scared you all a little bit, I think that's probably a good thing. I want to show you a very, very interesting quote that I ran across. This is, uh, the fellow on the screen is the CEO of Google. It says Alphabet, they run Google. His quote is, artificial intelligence will have more profound impact on humanity than fire, electricity, and the internet. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Think about it. Fire, electricity, the internet, they're good things. But as parents and grandparents, don't we teach our children that fire burns? Electricity can kill and the internet can be dangerous? There's a responsibility that comes with these things and we're not even thinking about the responsibility that comes with artificial intelligence. See, As I said, it's part of their nature now. You have to get in with them when they're young and say, this is a computer, darling. It makes up things that you want to hear, son. This isn't real. What's real is, this is where the birds land and build their nests. This is the real love that you're showing for your brother, your sister, that's real. The computer can't be real like that. We have to teach them that artificial intelligence is just a tool. Knowing that they may have the same separation anxiety that you have if you can't find the remote control. Think about that. We have five remotes in our house, and one time I couldn't find one of them. And there was something on TV I really wanted to watch. So I had to download a different app for that model TV so I could change the channel. Yes, I was getting anxious until AI fixed my problem. And I'm a grown man. Imagine me being 10, 11, 12, 13 years old. Now it's a traumatic experience. So 
So I want to take these little three R's, if I could, and just put some scripture around them and say this is how we might want to approach these three ways that kids are learning now and uh, use this as kind of maybe a gateway for you to have those conversations with them. When we're talking about relationships and building relationships, we could teach them the, the lessons from 1 Corinthians. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. It may be overly obvious, but that's the very first thing, that's the very first starting point when teaching children about their relationships with AI. Yes, it can be a good tool, but it can also corrupt you. It can create very bad behavior. We can use James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, right there when James kicks off this whole letter. And this sets the tone for the whole book of James. He says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. You instill this into a child from the time they're walking and talking. You're starting to give them an antibody for those times they face hard times in a virtual world. And when you're thinking about how you're going to govern or help them move along through taking reflection and trying to understand where God is in their lives and where virtual reality fits in their, in their lives, John 15:4. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain on the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. They have to understand that they are God's children. And that's a lesson they have to learn very early. That even more than them being your grandchild, they're God's child. Kids want to bear fruit. They want to show you that they can be all the things that you would have them be. They want to have that relationship. They want to be nurtured. They want to be loved. They want to be told right from wrong. Paul first started talking about Romans 1.18 is that we all know who God is. We all feel that presence of God in our lives. Even the young children, they know that there's something there guiding them. Our job is to make sure faster than a dependence on computers, on artificial intelligence. We have to be the firewall for this generation. can't be. You, you have to be there. I said fall. The future are great. it and understand. See, with the right you can teach them how to use the technology to grow their strength. That's there. Let's encourage our children to use 
Christ. Because that's exactly what we We see that they are the instruments of time with your children. Does anyone here right now do that? When they come to visit, are you just babysitting or are you pre about things? I hope today has changed your mind and made you understand the importance of doing that. I want to close with this. When I think about artificial intelligence, I am very much comforted by knowing that we are built in the image of God. All of us, we were built in the image of God no machine ever will be. And as AI continues and evolves and it, it mimics certain human attributes and behavior, it can never, never, ever replicate the qualities that make us human. The capacity for love, our ability to show compassion, and our divine creativity. That's what you embed inside your children and grandchildren. You make them fully understand that they too are children of God. We're spiritual beings. We possess what only the children of God can possess. The love of our Father. Who sent his Son to die on the cross so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are just so grateful for all the ways that you've brought technology into our life, all the ways that you've allowed us to manifest different ways of serving humanity through the technology in hospitals and the online ability for doctors to even do surgeries remotely and all the wonderful ways that we are using technology and artificial intelligence in our life. The Lord, we also help to ask that you help us guide our children to the right use of technology, that you help us understand and discern the ethical boundaries for technology. And Lord, we just ask that you continue to remind us that we are your children, we are your chosen, and that we're loved. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Oh,